So welcome to today's Postgres conference webinars, Long Queries and the Art of Full Scan. We're joined by Henrietta Dombrovskaya, Director of Analytics at BrokerX, who will discuss which queries are considered long, how to optimize full table scans, how the order of joins affects query performance, how to optimize grouping, how to avoid multiple table scans and additional techniques for long query optimization. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. A little bit about your speaker. So Henrietta is a database researcher and developer with over 35 years of academic and industrial experience. She holds a PhD in computer science from the University of St. Petersburg. And at present, she's, like I said, the director of data analytics at BrokerX, the local organizer of the Chicago Pug, an active community member, a frequent speaker at the PostgreSQL conferences, a researcher focused on developing efficient interactions between applications and databases, um, and the author of PostgreSQL query optimization book. So with that, I'm going to hand it off. Take it away, Eddie. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for your kind introduction and thank you for inviting me and thank you for organizing this webinar. It's always great to be here. Uh, so today's presentation, um, uh, so this logo is uh, for me and my co-author Boris Novikov, and uh, conveniently our initials kind of make DB in the middle, Henrietta Dombrovska, Boris Novikov. We did not quite figure out what to do with H and N, so if somebody have better ideas, um, just please share, but so far we are focused on DB in the middle. So uh, we, all right. Um, the name of the talk is uh, Long Queries in the Art of Full Scan. So originally it was just the art of full scan, but uh, yes, uh, it has something to do with long queries. So in the beginning of this uh, webinar, I posted a question, which queries are considered long? And uh, normally I ask people and like listen to audience responses, but um, that's basically for like, you know, if somebody want to share their thoughts, what they think about which queries are considered long, please share because we will be talking about this in the, uh, like in a minute. Uh, so this talk uh, also I just wanted to let you know, it is, uh, this presentation is based uh, on uh, chapters from the book, Postgres query optimization, which was published by a press a publisher in uh, May 2021. And the uh, book is available on Amazon and electronic version is available. Uh, and uh, for this book, we created uh, an open source database, which is called Postgres Air. So I just want to emphasize uh, that though we created it in connection with the book, but it's not a part of the book. You do not need to purchase a book to use it. It's open source and uh, you can uh, go uh, to this GitHub and uh, download it and download all instructions and some source codes and play and experiment. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, it's the largest existing uh, publicly available Postgres database. So please use. Uh, and uh, the examples in this talk will be based uh, on the tables which are part of this uh, Postgres database. So uh, if you did not get a chance to look into it, that's fine, because I think that uh, like all the joins are pretty much understandable, but maybe for future references, you want to take a look. So now uh, let's uh, proceed with um, the topic. So uh, full scan and long queries are somehow related. And uh, just for start, uh, let's think about which queries are considered long. So I will just use the replies which I receive most, uh, most often. Uh, so first of all, nobody wants actually to talk about full scan. Nobody wants to talk about long queries. You know, it's not a cool topic. It's super cool to talk about indices. You go to any conference and there are like tons of talks about what are new indices, how cool they are, how make your queries faster. Long queries, full scan, it's like nobody talks about it because it seems like hopeless and not interesting. So during this talk, I want to prove that actually there is 
lots of interesting things you can do with long queries and lots of things you can do with full scans. So which queries are considered long? Uh, first of all, it does not depend neither on the size of the query itself, nor in the size of output. Because for example, if you take this query, that will be a long query with long output. So what it does, it does Cartesian product of two copies uh, of the AirPods table. So by this query makes sense, it lists all possible airline routes from any airport to any airport. So that will be a long query because there are lots of airports, it's Cartesian product, and there will be huge output. So that's a long query. On the other hand, you can look at this query, and this is a query with a very short output because how big is the output here? Just one line, right? Just one line. So what we are calculating here, we are calculating the average flight length in the average number of passengers through the whole database. And that's a lot of data to go through. The super long query, but the output is small. So the size of output does not really tell us whether it's a long query or it's not a long query. Uh, so what is a long query then? So let's go to the formal definition. Uh, that's again, <laughs> it's not formal definition from the textbook, but that's something we came up with. So a query is long when the query selectivity is high, which means that almost all rows contribute to the output, even if the output size is small. So what it means, in order to get uh, the result of this query, you need to touch most of the rows in the tables. And most maybe like not 80%, even 30% of the rows means like almost all very like significant part of each of the tables or most of the tables. Uh, and the other thing worth mentioning is that the notion of what is long changes because each time with Postgres, with each Postgres version, we have new access techniques, new indices, new ways of data storage, new everything. So, you know, if you look at examples like from 10, 15 years ago, Five million row table, like, oh my gosh, how do you deal with five million row table? I don't even know that if you have a sample size of 100,000, oh, that is like very good sample. And now, like, you know, recently I was looking, what size is this table? Oh, it's just 15 million rows. Gosh, it's nothing. It's nothing to optimize. So <laughs> this notion changes. So uh, just, you know, we just have to keep it in mind that all this is relative. The technique, though, stays the same. Uh, so, can long query be optimized? <laughs> That's like a, the question which I started from, because uh, the sad thing is that not only people do not want to optimize query, long queries, but often uh, there is like this widespread presumption that they cannot be optimized. Okay, that's a long query. Okay, just ask your marketing analytics in your company. It's something super long. They always need marketing analytics. They always need everything, right? They want to have all data from the inception date for the past 10 years, and they need to load them to their models and do something with this data. So most of the time, people just say, no, we cannot optimize them. Why? Why? Uh, and uh, actually, here's the thing. So first, yes, they can be optimized how they can be optimized. There are two main techniques which I will be covering. Uh, one is avoiding multiple table scans and the other want to make sure to reduce the size of the result at the earliest possible stage. Uh, and uh, like one thing which is not on the slide, why we need to optimize them? Because uh, <laughs> you might have heard um, People tell you, you know what, that's okay. This query does not need to be optimized. It just runs once a week, once a day, once a week, once a month. So you know what? Do you know what once a week means, by the way? I can tell you what it means. Once a week means that it's 9 a.m. Monday, always. When it's once a week, it's 9 a.m. Monday. And you know how many queries run once a week, Monday, 9 a.m., and your database is like 
crashing because of all these queries which do not need to be optimized. The other thing, if you just leave them go like this, it will be five minutes today, 10 minutes next week, an hour, like three months later, and then all of a sudden it cannot be done before a business actually needs these results and then we have a bigger problem. So uh, long queries, they will never run in milliseconds. They might never run in seconds, but we still want to optimize them. Uh, what is important about long queries? Uh, we do not need indices. That's why we're talking about full scan. Why we do not need indices? Uh, so this graph is actually, you have you could see this graph in many different presentations. It represents the cost of operations depending on the query selectivity. So the higher selectivity, uh, the high is the cost, but the cost changes differently depending on the query selectivity. So you can see that uh, for the full scan, which is the green line here, the cost is always the same, no matter whether it's high or low selectivity. You always kind of need to go through the whole table. For indices though, the story is different. When you need to select something uh, with very low selectivity level, just a couple of rows from multi-million row table, yes, index will give you fast results when you need this couple of uh, rows. If you need like, 20% of this table, then using indices actually will cost more because you'll need to go to index and go to the table and uh, the blocks in the table are not necessarily um, located one after another, so the cost will rise. So for the full scan, uh, it doesn't matter. And uh, so for queries with high selectivity, that's what we want to use because in the long run, uh, uh, full scan will be just performing better. Uh, and uh, uh, what next thing we need to know about full scans, uh, we need, so first rule of optimizing full queries is uh, the most restrictive semi-join uh, should be executed first. So uh, some of you may heard about semi-join, some of you might not have heard about semi-join. So what is semi-join? We do not know this. It's not in the list of relational operations. Okay. Semi-join is a join between two tables. Uh, and you've done it. You might not know the word, but you've done it, I'm, I assure you. If you use exist subquery or you used in uh, operation and you have subselect with this in, that's when you use semi-joins. So uh, we are returning the rows from the table on the left side without duplicating uh, when uh, these rows satisfy the predicate on the right side. And I know those all these words, predicate and whatever. So let's actually look at, let's look at examples. And then you, then you will know that you actually used semi-joins. So uh, these are examples of semi-joins. Uh, in this table. So select from flights with flight ID and select flights from booking lab. What it means, by the way, it means that somebody booked a trip with this flight, okay? Because booking lab is a part of the reservation. So this flight was booked. Uh, or the other version, select from flights where exist select flight ID from booking lab. So both of these uh, examples are semantically identical in both select flights, which are part of some bookings. Uh, for both of them, we'll have the same execution plan. In this execution plan, you will see this semi-join. So uh, what that means that, again, we are joining, but we are also eliminating duplicates. So by selecting flights, uh, which satisfy this criteria. For both, uh, it will be the same plan. Uh, now, okay, I get it. So semi-join restrict the data set. So how do I know if I have several semi-joins, which one is the better one? So let's take a look. Uh, that's a long query, okay? Uh, because it selects all the <laughs> flights, all the reservations for the United States from this database. It's like a long query. So what we have here, we have uh, one join like uh, booking like with flights, and then we have semi-join with airports table. And uh, here, uh, the airports are from the United States. 
So you can see here that has joined because uh, we are doing sequential scan on the airport with countries US, but this is executed before the uh, next join because using this join, we reduce the size of the next result set. So if it would be going consecutively, joining all booking legs with all flights and only after that, reduce it to the flights from US, that will be way longer query. So Postgres is smart enough to figure out, first we select airport code, and then we reduce the size, and then we join with booking labs. Okay, uh, so here, okay, yeah, we got it. That's some restriction. Um, by the way, uh, here we do not have index. So in this execution plan, we purposely, we did not create an index because that is actually not good <laughs> uh, column to index. But you might wonder what would happen if uh, we would index. So I can tell you, if you create an index and if you uh, was this technically should not use it, but it might accidentally. So this one will be executed slower. Uh, this one will be executed slower than full table scan. So now, what if uh, we have two semi joints? So, uh, and I apologize, it's a little bit crowded slide. I'm just trying to fit everything with my slide, which is not always easy. So, uh, here there are two semi joints. So, first we select again airport code uh, with a country US and uh, the bookings, which were updated before uh, July 1st, 2020. So, to give you some perspective, the Postgres Air database uh, became live in August 2020. So in this database, today is August 18, 2020. So this gives us kind of like last month and a half of all the reservations which are in this database. Uh, so you look at this, uh, you cannot even tell which of this is more restrictive, right? And uh, uh, I mean, again, I. I'm not asking like 100 people what they think which one is more restrictive, but at least it's not obvious. So let's see what Postgres thinks about it. So that is the execution plan. And you can actually see that here, the scan on the airport is executed prior to the sequential scan on booking, right? So first airports, then booking which means that Postgres thinks that uh, this uh, selection by US is more restrictive, which is actually right, because there are like lots of flights. Again, there are lots of flights for like uh, eight weeks of seven weeks of data. Uh, but if you uh, we will modify it, so uh, if you will change update condition and uh, we will select, um, dates not starting from July 1st, but starting from August 1st, then there will be a different story. So here, uh, Postgres actually can figure out not only that uh, this is more restrictive semi join but also, by the way, you can use an index here. So uh, this one will be executed first. So execution plan changed based on the statistics, based on which data uh, we are um, passing to this query as parameters. Uh, and by the way, uh, does index make it better? Uh, so here we saw that we used an index and uh, does index make it better? Uh, so um, this is the way, uh, like another version of this query where we modified uh, there is query transformation which blocks the usage of index. So semantically, this is the same because updated timestamp is never null. But uh, using this transformation, we block Postgres from utilizing the index. And uh, let's see what will uh, what will happen. So if we are going uh, to this execution plan, uh, so. Uh, so here we, we are blocking an index, and here we can experiment and see when it will be faster, when it will be slower. So, um, and if you make the same experiments on this Postgres database, you will see that indeed index will work uh, when uh, this timestamp is uh, like allows us to select smaller intervals. So for this particular case, again, today is um, 
August 18th. And uh, if the timestamp is um, earlier than August 1st, full scan works better. If it's like August 1st or later, uh, then index usage works better. Okay. Uh, so that's about semi-joint. So second technique, enter join. Again, enter join, even if you did not know uh, how it is called, you definitely used it. Uh, it's either not exist and not in. Again, technically speaking, both notations are semantically correct. However, in Postgres, only first form guarantees anti join in the execution plan. So if we look at the execution plan of these two, so first one will show us anti join, and the second one, uh, where we have not sub plan, uh, it will not use anti join, but again, semantically, they are identical, and execution is pretty much the same uh, for both of these versions. So, uh, question if people ask now, why all this exists, not exist, anti join, semi join, why just not use join? So, what will happen? So, uh, something will happen. So, first of all, uh, if we use just join instead of semi join, we need to make sure that we are not selecting duplicates. Because um, if we will uh, use first of these SQL statements instead of semi join, we will receive duplicates. And in order to avoid duplicates, we will need to first select distinct flight IDs from booking legs and then join it with flights. Uh, and uh, if you uh, look, uh, at the execution plan, by the way, uh, you can, uh, if you are wondering whether it's faster or slower, it is actually twice faster. So again, uh, using semi-join is not always desirable, but each time I cannot tell you whether it will be always like this or not. So uh, you need to experiment and see which one will work better. Okay. Uh, so can we do auto-join instead of anti-join? Actually, yes, because for anti join, there is no question of removing or not removing duplicates. So uh, you can use the same, uh, like auto join, uh, where here, like flight ID is null. It is again semantically the same. And you can see anti join in the execution plan. And uh, so you can see, oops, sorry. Okay, uh, you can uh, see anti join in execution plan, and um, this actually like works the same, and sometimes even better. Uh, and by the way, uh, if you uh, just if you just need flight ID from the flights table, so uh, you do not need. Uh, you do not need the rest in the flights, then uh, the execution plan will be different again, and it will be even faster because here you uh, actually can use index only scan on both tables, and then you know it's all different story. So again, it's technically a long query, but when we can use index only scan, then uh, we might even do not need full scan, and this might be faster. All right. Now we talked about the order of uh, joins and uh, how it matters and how selecting the right order of joins uh, actually helps to improve query performance. But then the question is, okay, uh, how I can tell Postgres that I want this uh, order of joins? Because uh, <laughs> again, uh, you know, uh, those of you guys who've been with Postgres for a while or Postgres is your first database, you might even not know that other DBMSs allow you to dictate the order of joins. But for people like I, who came from very long-term relationships with Oracle, there's like, what do you mean? You cannot give optimizer hints. You cannot tell which order of join to use. Nope, you cannot Postgres decides. So, so far, uh, you know, what we saw, we can tell, okay, Postgres chooses the right order of joins, but, uh, well, what, what can we do, basically? Uh, what can we do to help it? Most of the time, nothing except of uh, choosing the right way of writing queries. So um, in this uh, first half of the presentation, I showed different ways to write semantically the same query, uh, which um, 
like uh, might give you different execution plan. Uh, and usually it's nothing you can do with tuning parameters, but there is one parameter which you can turn uh, locally. And that's something which I always kind of, you know, suggest people to experiment. So this uh, parameter is join collapse limit. You can set it uh, within your session. And what it tells you, it tells you how many different versions, um, so what optimizer does to optimize the order of joints. So uh, by default, uh, it is set to eight. And um, what it means that, okay, so if you have up to eight tables joined in one query, optimizer will uh, choose different execution plans. No, actually, now I'm saying eight factorial. In reality, it's not eight factorial, it is less. So uh, in the reality, um, optimizer um, would uh, like, it's, pre-select uh, the potentially good execution plans. Uh, but anyway, uh, so if uh, the number of tables is like less than eight, uh, it will try to find the optimal order of joints. If it's more than joint collapse limit, it's like, okay, you know what, whatever, in whatever order, I will just uh, fall over to the uh, like st standard uh, optimization. Uh, so, uh, and sometimes people want to increase this uh, parameter to uh, something greater than eight. So again, uh, we normally do not recommend to uh, increase it to more than 12 because otherwise uh, the number of plans that it have to analyze. So look, um, if N is uh, eight, it's like 40,000 plans. If N is 10, it's like over 3 million plans. And, uh, just uh, uh, finding best plan takes forever. Uh, so I have uh, one horror story from my history. So once um, I talked to a data scientist who asked me uh, what's wrong with his query. So his query had uh, 30 tables to join, which is like something very predictable, very much expected from data scientists. And uh, in order to um, have the best execution plan, uh, he said uh, joint collapse limit to 30. So you know what happened? It's not only uh, that the query could not run, the explain plan command never finished because there's too many things. I mean, you can <laughs> try to <laughs> estimate how many plans uh, uh, Postgres query plan I had to analyze. So in OLAP, uh, in data warehousing, uh, it might be actually a good idea if you know exactly what you need, because often you have, okay, you have like a couple of fact tables and all other side dimensions, and you know that your dimensions had to go last, right? So sometimes you can say, okay, Postgres, I know better, and set join collapse limit to one, and then explicitly write the order of joins, which you actually no will be the best one. And uh, again, uh, what I suggest, uh, like this is local parameter, it can be set to your local session, just change it for your local experiment. You can see uh, how long does it take to produce uh, like the best execution plan, and you can see whether it makes any material difference. Okay, uh, grouping, next topic. because. Also, when we have these long queries, which touch most of that in tables, we have grouping. Uh, so that's like long query with grouping. What we have here, we have all bookings in our database. So for each flight, we select an average price of the ticket and we select a, a number of passengers on the slide. So good long query with grouping, nothing bad with this so far, not much you can do. Uh, and uh, you know what's next happened? You know, I hate views by the way. So why I hate views? Because next thing somebody figured out how to calculate it and they save this query as a view in the database. Uh, and then somebody wants to see uh, information about particular flight. So select from whatever we just selected where flight id equals some certain flight id 
And that's actually the real number from the post research database, so everything can be replicated. Uh, so what do you think will happen? What you'll see? And again, I cannot like ask you to raise hands. You know, you do not know what will happen. But uh, what I can tell you, what will happen depends on uh, where you are. Okay. So it did not work in all versions. Uh, why it did not work in all versions of Postgres? Because here grouping is done uh, before uh, select. Uh, so in earlier versions of Postgres, how this would work, everything will be calculated, all this like group by, and then after this, uh, there will be selection of the specific flight. So that would be like super inefficient. So now, um, like I think starting from at least Postgres 11, if not earlier, uh, actually the conditions can be pushed inside group by, by Postgres, by Postgres optimizer without any effort from your part. Uh, so the right way of writing this query would be like this. You uh, do the flight ID and then you group when you already pre-selected flight ID. So now you do not need to do it, Postgres does it automatically. So no matter whether you uh, did it like in the first slide, first group then select or you do select the execution plan will be the same and you can see in this execution plan uh, that it will first select the flight and then we'll do all the grouping so uh, if we have any condition which is imposed on the fields involved in the group by current version of postgres will push it up and again, not current, it's already like several versions. So uh, here, for example, uh, we condition uh, put a condition departure airport is where then O'Hara Airport in Chicago. And uh, if you look at this execution plan, that will be the right execution plan. So first, Postgres will pre-select all the airports, which are uh, all the flights which uh, depart from O'Hara Airport, and then everything else. Uh, Again, by the way, everything else is hair joints, right? Um, again, it's long way, it's still long way. <laughs> like it's uh, like uh, one of the busiest airports in the world. Still long way, but the first part is first we pre-select all flights we start from a hair and that makes life easier. That makes this query to be executed as fast as possible. Right, so next, uh, but it's not always the truth. So here, look at this condition. Uh, now, same uh, subselect, uh, and uh, we select the flights where departure is uh, like between, actually it's around 4th of July, okay? Uh, and the number of flights which we want is really small, but uh, the departure, scheduled departure is in no way part of this inner grouping. So Postgres is not pushing this condition. So if you look at the execution plan of this query, that is how it will look. So you can see that there are like tons of hash joints and everything, all the grouping is done and all the after the grouping is done, then uh, we select the flights which satisfy this condition and uh, then the results are joined. So that is something which is like not optimized and uh, not even not optimized, but Okay, that is called pessimization. And I, I did not invent this word like people before me invented this. So that's like the practice which guarantees slowing down the execution of this query. So again, why it happens? Because uh, like uh, there is no way for positives to push this condition uh, inside. Okay. Uh, and uh, that is something which we can explicitly avoid. So how we can write better queries to not have this situation happen. So that is the correct uh, way to write the SQL, right? So we first, uh, so we include this criteria inside and we filter before grouping. So this one will be executed much faster and much better. So here you can see that uh, it starts from pre-selecting flights. So using a bitmap index scan and uh, like life is much better this way. Uh, all right. The opposite situation. Uh, so now I told you first you need to filter, then to group. Sometimes though, you need to do the opposite. 
and it's important to distinguish between two cases. So here is another query. So what we're doing here? We are selecting a number of passengers uh, departing each month from each city, pretty much, right? So again, long query. Uh, and we are writing it like, as I said, we select joint airports, flights, booking legs, boarding passes, and okay, voila, we have uh, all this like number of people. Uh, this query on PostgreSQL database, if you install it locally, will execute for seven minutes, legit, right? Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, execution plan, as you expect, like all the hash joints, like nothing interesting. How we can make it faster? We can make it faster. That's how we can make it faster. So first, uh, so first of all, city has nothing to do with all other calculations. City is an attribute of the airport, and airport is an attribute of flight. So we can do all the calculations using only booking leg and boarding pass. And after we are done, we can join with flights, we join with airports. So here we do grouping first, and then we um, uh, like doing all the rest. So in this case, uh, that's the execution plan. Again, it still has join, but uh, it limits the size of the uh, intermediate result set. Uh, so this time uh, it will execute two and a half minutes. It's still long query. It's super long query, but it's almost three times faster than the original query. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, another technique uh, using set operation. So what we often can we can use uh, except instead of not exist, intersect instead of exist and not in, and use union instead of complex selection criteria with or. So I will just show one example. Again, the same thing, flights which are not booked, ever booked. So instead of doing in or not in, uh, we do select flight ID from flights, except select flight ID from booking leg. Execution time, twice faster than anti-join. Again, it's all for the long queries. It might not be necessarily true for queries which can utilize indices. Uh, and that's the execution plan. Again, it's yet another execution plan. So always check what, what works the best. And uh, one more example. Uh, so here we're doing the opposite. We are selecting flights which have some bookings on them. So here it's uh, not accept, but intersect, it's even faster. And again, a different execution plan from what we saw before. Uh, in the last technique I will cover, because actually I promised more than I can when I looked at how much time I have and what I promised, <laughs> like, that's not necessarily, uh, so I won't be able to cover uh, like uh, views, materialized views and such, but one technique I want to show, avoid multiple table scans. So when multiple table scans happen, so if you develop any system for a while, you come to the point when you need to store data, which is like, something new, something you did not plan and you need to store it somewhere. So what people do, people create special types, custom fields or whatever, like almost all systems I know have these custom fields. So here, what we need, uh, so the regulations change, we need to store passengers, passport information in the system, passport number, passport expiration day, passport country, and we do not know how regulation change next week. You know, we all uh, lived through the pandemic, you have no regulation changes, now we need to store COVID tests, like uh, whatever. So <laughs> we want to be proactive and we create a table, custom field, and uh, for each passenger, we store whatever. We have several custom field types and uh, each type stores something. So now we need to uh, select for all passengers, their passport number, passport expiration date and country. And uh, okay, so why it is uh, limited uh, to like whatever 5 million here, it was uh, just a question of, um, so when we did, uh, when we ran this examples for the book and like for PostgreSQL database, we wanted to make sure that we do not have disk failover because um, we need to, uh, uh, because we needed to make sure that our data sets all sit in main memory and all the times are realistic. So that's the only reason you can see here limitations by ID. Okay, but anyway, typical uh, situation, what people do, 
you join uh, this table custom field three times. Because, okay, first time you select passport number, next time you select expiration date, and next time you select a uh, country that issued passport. Uh, so what will happen with the execution plan? Scan, 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 how many times? Three times. Scan on huge table, okay? Uh, and uh, this is not the best way of doing it because you know what, you can do everything with one scan. Uh, that's how we do this. Um, so we scan this table once and uh, we look at each record and if it's a passport number, okay, here is it. If it's passport expiration date, here is it. If it's passport country, here is it. All the rest skip, all the rest is now, okay? And uh, here we group me, okay, uh, problem solved. Uh, is problem solved? Actually, problem is not solved. So horror story. Uh, that's an example which uh, in many of you probably use this technique. It's like technique widely available. Okay, uh, problem is solved. And you know what happened? This works slower than the previous version. Why do you think it works slower? Again, I cannot really do like raising hands, but I can tell you, why it is slower. It's actually not even slower. So that is our uh, execution plan. So why it is so bad? It is so bad because it's not only bad, but it is incorrect. Because how we were grouping here, we were grouping people by first name and last name. And how many people with the same first and last name? Plenty. And it does not matter that we need to print all the first and last name. We need to have all distinct people. So this was incorrect. So what we're doing now, a little bit more like a uh, like little bit more sophisticated, but actually the right version. So now we do passenger ID, although we do not need to have passenger ID. And then we group by uh, passenger ID, first name and last name. And this actually is executed much better and much faster. So that's our new execution plan. And uh, this, uh, does what we want. Now, one more optimization. So one more optimization we are doing here, we can reduce the size of intermediate results, same as we just did with airports in the cities, because we do not need first and last name until we're done grouping and selecting. So uh, what we're doing first. So first, I do not know how much is visible. Uh, I cannot do that, <laughs> but uh, we have here a yeah, sub-select, and we only group uh, this custom fields uh, for each passenger ID. And when we are done with this, we have passenger ID. And for this passenger ID, we have a passport expiration date and passport country. And then we join it with passengers. So this is, will be actually the best execution plan and executed fast no matter what, though again, it's still super long query. And by the way, it even helps us because here we can uh, use index on passenger uh, passenger ID and do merge join and uh, this will like uh, this will execute much faster. So again, we cannot tell Postgres precisely what we need, but we can write a query this way that it makes it easier for Postgres to do this. Okay. Uh, and uh, okay, so so uh, summary, summary, what we don't. So optimization goal for long queries is to reduce size of intermediate data set. So all technique I showed today had this goal. We need to make sure that we do not join, we do not start from largest tables and we do not scan things which we do not need to scan. And to achieve this goal, we have several techniques. Control the join order, use semi-join, item join, filtering before grouping, or grouping before filtering, whatever makes sense. Uh, use set operations instead of all of the above technique and avoid multiple table scans. Uh, so this, uh, again, you will need to try and see what works. So, I think I'm keeping telling, uh, you cannot learn these techniques and you cannot just apply them mindlessly that uh, you need to look at your system, you need to look at your statistics and uh, you need to look what works for you. And 
it's very easily that for each of these long queries, you need to use several ways and see which will produce the best results. Okay, and Lindsay, I think I actually did it well and we have minutes, 10 minutes for questions, right? We sure do. That was great. Um, we have three, four questions here. Um, and if our attendees have any others, go ahead and, and get them in. Um, so the first one is a little bit long, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a good question. I've been told that if a query has 12 tables involved, but the joint collapse limit is eight, for instance, then it will perform very similarly to joint collapse limit equals one. Does the planner actually look at the first eight before just deciding to add those other tables in at the end um, in the order declared? Yeah, so, uh, okay. So if the number of tables involved is greater than joint collapse limit, then yes, this behavior is like pretty much uh, what was described. So uh, the optimizer will like literally use like one, two, three, four, whatever, oh, however the joint order is defined in the query. So what I meant by setting joint collapse limit to one, because sometimes even if you have eight tables involved, you know what to do. You might know what to do better than Postgres optimizer. Uh, and uh, then you just want to oh, like, okay, forget about it. I know what to do. Beautiful. Um, there's been some discussion in the chat um, and the question asker has asked me to ask you, what are their units of cost? Uh, okay, <laughs> units of cost. Are, uh, uh, so the units which you see in the execution, uh, like in the execution plan, are kind of like abstract cost, and you can read in documentation how uh, they are set up. So basically, in uh, uh, when you set up the uh, in the Postgres instance, uh, the cost is assigned by default to all operations, and you can modify it. But um, the idea is so what you can tell about the cost. The cost is uh, proportional to the number of IO operations and uh, some uh, also to the uh, CPU usage. So it's like separate big thing how it is uh, how it is calculated. But yeah, that two main factors which is trying to balance. Uh, most of the time uh, we are looking at the cost is, so the more the cost uh, means that there are more uh, read operations involved. So that's like on a very, very, very like high level. Great, thank you. Do you recommend using global temporary tables to break up many joins into a series of intermediate steps? Uh, no, and that is something which I actually did not cover because first I like, uh, you know, uh, I had plans to cover this part, uh, how to use temporal tables and how not to use temporal tables. So in general, uh, like in 95% of the cases using temporal tables is not justified. So maybe I need to give another talk on this because I actually uh, will left behind all using of CTs, using of temporal tables, using views and using materialized views. And uh, I maybe can have a separate talk about this. But in general, I caution people against using a global or non-global temporary tables. Well, you know, Hetty, we have uh, availability in November if you want to present again. Yeah, uh, I, I already presented in October, you remember, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, third time's the charm, right? Yeah, um, totally. Okay, so we have two more questions. Uh -huh. Do you recommend using of extension PG hint plan so that we can use hints and influence join orders? Um, I personally did not work with this so i cannot kind of you know give any expert advice about this um and i probably should look and see what you know what will happen so from my uh, previous long-term experience again my uh, attitude in general towards hints i know why postgres uh like core contributors are against hints uh and uh, actually my personal opinion the absence of hints in postgres made it the best optimizer I know. And, uh, you know, with my like 38 years of experience in industry, I've seen a lot. And I think that uh, 
one of the driving factor for Postgres optimizer being so outstanding and not matched by any commercial and non-commercial systems is because it is programmed to function correctly without hints. So hints are often great and sometimes you miss it because oh my gosh, I know, I know, I know why it does what it does because I know how to do it right. But when you start using hints, it's kind of difficult to stop using them and then you kind of like get hooked on indices and you on, on hints and you always have to adjust them and uh, then uh, make sure that they still work and data changes. So great part about avoiding hints is that your data can grow, data can grow not with the same speed. So the um, like comparative volumes of data in different tables might change. Uh, and uh, if you do not use hints, there are better chances that it will be still performant, although nobody can guarantee this. So, but uh, I actually did not use this extension and uh, I will take a look at it. Great, and our last question. Um, what do you do about queries with moderate selectivity, say approximately 10% of the table, when index only scans aren't possible? Say you have a gin index. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Uh, experiment, uh, you know, like uh, honestly, experiment because again, uh, moderate selectivity is a very tricky situation because here, first of all, you do not know how it will decide to work, and second, uh, moderate selectivity. Uh, okay, it's maybe an index on a column, and uh, the values of the column may not be distributed uniformly. So in the book, we have like a follow up of this example with. A country equal US. Uh, so if country is the country with smaller airports, so in general, index by country is moderate selectivity, uh, but it might work, for example, for uh, countries where we have very little number of airports in this country. Um, so, uh, and again, this is like one small portion of the whole query optimization. So, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, it's still worth to create index. Sometimes what might help uh, create a conditional uh, partial index, index with a where clause. Uh, most of the time, actually, that's what works because if you want to select like something very specific, uh, index with where clause might work. But again, that's like the whole part of big optimization picture. Okay, wonderful. Hetty, thank you so much. I always know that um, you're going to bring an awesome presentation. Um, and I always know that you're going to get solid questions from the audience. I mean, it's, it's just that engaging. So thank you. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us. Thank you to all of our question askers for keeping it lively. Um, and I hope to see you on future Postgres conference webinars. So cheers. <laughs>